If you have teenagers, chances are they've seen the movie The Hunger Games. It's been in theaters only a few weeks, but the film version of the popular book series has already become one of the biggest hits in Hollywood history. And because of The Hunger Games and the book series, kids all over are talking about dystopia. Our cinema analyst, Bill Timoney, joins us now to explain why, in Hollywood terms, the future looks bright when it looks really bleak. Bill, help us out here. Dystopia? Dystopia, Laura Bryan. Hi. Yeah, a, a dystopian film is a film that's set in the future where everything is a mess. And Hollywood has a long tradition of making a lot of money mm -hmm. with this genre. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term dystopia, it comes from utopia. Right. That the idea that somewhere in the future on Earth we will have a perfect society where the city works well, people are happy, and government functions. That concept has been, you've, uh, it first appears in Plato's Republic, it's in the writings of St. Augustine, but it's Sir Thomas More in 1519 who writes a book describing such a place and it's titled Utopia. That's why we have Utopia. Dystopia is the opposite. In the 19th century, uh, the great philosopher John Stuart Mill uh, gave a speech in Parliament where he criticized uh, a British project of, that they described as utopian. He said, no, it's not going to work. It's more like it's dystopia. And that's where we get the word. You know, it's become a popular concept. We've seen it in classic novels, Brave New World, sure. 1984, The Shape of Things to Come, Fahrenheit 451. All of those are great classics, and they've all been made into movies somewhere along the line, sometimes two and three times. And they join a long list of movies like Metropolis to Blade Runner, Planet of the Apes, the Terminator movies. Somewhere in the future, it's going to be a terrible place, but some, your protagonist is going to have to overcome and survive somehow. Well, what's the, the psychology world? behind the appeal of that? Why, why We just keep going back to that genre, but it works. Sure. Well, you know, I think, well, especially when you're young, you're thinking about the future. You know, when you get to people my age, you're thinking about the past and you're not looking forward to the future so much. Well, let's talk about The Hunger Games. Okay. What makes that different than all of these other series? There's a terrific distinction from this and every other movie, and that's why the author Suzanne Collins has been so such a genius with it. It's the first time we've seen a young female protagonist. Uh, the, the, the hero, Katniss, is, is an adolescent, you know, and like most adolescents, she's controlled by adults telling her what to do when she sees the world that they're creating and the rules they're implying on her are not really working. So I think kids really respond to that kind of a problem. So in a way the cinema villains are kind of stand-ins for the adults that yeah, kids in a way, tell 12, what to you're, tell you're, kids you're, what you're, to do. Yeah, if you're not a grown-up, you don't have control of your life. You're being told what to do. You're following the rules that other people have made. And I think you really respond to a dystopian film where the story is just like that, only all the adults are uh, they're making a mess of everything, and it's going to be up to you to save the world. You know, it's, it's interesting, this, this whole dichotomy between what we saw as the heroes and what right. the kids see as the heroes. You look at uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, uh, Will sure. Smith, uh, Tom Cruise, being, uh, you know, these guys that were the, the stars of those kinds of movies, mm -hmm. and now th that wouldn't happen in, in these new movies. No, and you're talking about Minority Report, I Am Legend, the Terminator movies, uh, The Running Man, those are all dystopians, mm -hmm. but kids today, they can't identify with that, but identify with a 15-year-old girl who really seems like she's one of them. That's why this film, even though it's only been out a few weeks, is already one of the highest grossing films in movie history. Wow. I'm going to turn the tables. Okay. I'm going to talk about your adolescence. My adolescence, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> uh, what I thought about was, what was I watching when I was that age of the target demographic for The Hunger Games? When I was 12, 13, 14. So what, a couple I years was, ago? Yeah, well, I'll give, you, I'll give you my three biggies from the early <laughs> okay. 70s. My first one up was Soylent Green that starred Charlton Heston. It's made in 1973. It takes place in 2022. It's mm -hmm. from a story called Make Room, Make Room. And it's all about how it's too many people, too many people everywhere, just thousands and millions and millions of people. And those of us who've seen it know that there's a secret of what is, quote, Soylent, Soylent Green. Green. Right. I don't want to ruin it for anybody. <laughs> Okay. Seen it. We we have, it's a lot of no fun. No spoiler. We, don't, we won't do a right. spoiler. Right. Uh, what about Rollerball? Rollerball is my second one. That came out in 75, and that took place in 2018. And like Soylent Green, the government is different. In this case, there are no more countries in Rollerball. There are only corporations. And the, the bread and circuses idea for the masses is this game, Rollerball. It's part roller derby, part hockey, and part slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. And the whole design of the game is individual achievement cannot succeed. You have to give up yourself for the good of the group. The and we have group. James Kahn as Jonathan E., who emerges as an individual hero in this game, 
which the corporations are not a big fan of. Exactly. There's some very 70s things about it. If you see mm -hmm. it today, the women are nothing but, but, but eye candy. They might as well be mannequins. But in other respects, it's very cool to see what in 1975 Hollywood was seeing would be happening in 2018. That's sure, cool. we saw that repeated in Blade Runner as well. Uh, completely in Blade Runner, which is still sort of like the classic of the entire dystopian genre. But I love my final one on the list is by Woody Allen. It's called Sleeper. Mm -hmm. It's the third movie he made. And it's his first movie with Diane Cannon, way before Annie Hall and all the other great movies. Mm -hmm. it's, it's set in 200 years in the future with that standard thing that H.G. Wells came out with about a guy who's chirogenically frozen and he, okay. he's, nobody forget, they forget to thaw him out. And he waits <laughs> a few hundred years later. Uh, it's, it's really fun to see now. He mixes very intellectual humor with really crazy, silly slapstick. And it's... Uh, well, he just proves that even 200 years in the future, no matter how dystopian it is, you'll still have room for laughs. Oh, that's wow. very cool. So when you go back and watch these movies from the 70s now, mm -hmm. is, uh, do you ever see any similarities of, oh, God, Hollywood's kind of got it right? or there, th Certainly there are moments like that, particularly when we talk about in Rollerball that it's corporations that run countries. I think we see that more and more today. And sure enough, other dystopian films since then have, have picked it up. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also hopeless... Uh, like some of the jokes, Woody Allen has a joke in Sleeper where he says the, the apocalypse happened when a man named Albert Shanker got hold of the bomb. Today nobody would laugh, but 1973 Albert Shanker ran sure. the teachers union and it was a very contentious figure. Got big laughs back then, nobody would laugh now. Yeah. All yeah. right, Bill Timoney, thank you so much. Thank for you your, so much. Uh, movie insight and trivia and knowledge, it's always, always a pleasure. I'm so glad you liked it.